This episode is sponsored by Turn Gymnastics Apparel, the brand dedicated solely to the sport of men's gymnastics. Choose Turn this season to outfit your team with industry-leading design concepts and elevated options for elite performance. Get the design process started today. Visit turn-gymnastics.com to discover the latest possibilities. Turn, never done perfecting. Thank you, Turn, for supporting the Sam Oldham podcast. Supporting Turn helps us bring you new content every single week from the world of gymnastics. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Sam Oldham podcast. In this episode of the Sam Oldham podcast, I'm joined by Felix Dolce. He was part of the Canadian men's gymnastics team that took part at the Paris Olympic Games this summer. They finished eighth in the team final, and it was the first time they were at the Olympic Games since Beijing in 2008. Felix was probably best known at the Olympic Games for competing in the all-around final and falling from the high bar after his high bar handguard snapped in half. It was an incredible performance. He got back onto the high bar. I was very impressed. I'm really looking forward to chatting to Felix today and learning a bit more about Canadian gymnastics. Felix, thanks for joining us, mate. Uh, Just to start off with, just tell us a little bit, what's life been like since the Games in Paris? Because we're in that weird space, right, where you've got athletes that are very much still in their peak and, and they're looking ahead to LA 2028 and they're getting straight back in the gym. Mm-hmm. You've got young athletes that are thinking, well, maybe some of these older guys, they're going to retire in the next four years or I could take their place. So they're already training hard. And then you've got some of the maybe more seasoned gymnasts, that are, like you said, some of your teammates are having a break, they're going on holiday. Where are you at and what's that experience been like since the games, mate? <clears throat> so for me right now, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm back into training officially. You know, okay. I'm really working towards, first of all, the new code, the new, you know, upcoming competitions such as uh, all the Euroleagues stuff. So everything regarding the, the Canadian program and the provincial programs uh, are, are now basically over for 2024. But we all know that once a new code comes around, it takes quite a bit of time to get used to it and get really, you know, well prepped to then once start the new year and have those solid routines uh, in, in the backup. So like I said, yeah, back to training officially, but at the same time, you know, after those games, a lot of, you know, attention and 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 I would say eyes came onto me, but also the sport itself into my province, into the country, which is super positive because I feel like, as we all know, uh, gymnastics is such a wonderful sport and should be known by more people. Yeah. And so I've been kind of attending events, doing more social stuff, uh, really trying to promote the sport as much as I can, promote my teammates, and overall, at the same time, enjoying my uh, after Olympic period, if I can say so. But uh, it's it's been a pretty busy one, but but a fun one for sure. Do you have anybody that represents you, Felix? Like, do you have an agent? I remember when uh, when twenty twelve happened. Most of the top guys in Great Britain all had were with agencies, had management. They were kind of taking care of these. You know, I can imagine you're getting asked to go to premieres of things, and you're being asked to go on mm. talk shows and that kind of stuff, and appear at events, hand out awards, which is great, right? That's something that Absolutely. you know when you start yeah. doing the sport, you don't expect that. That's just something that you're not. That's not why you get into it, right? You just want to be a gymnast. You just want to do well. But then slowly but surely, yeah. as you have that success. Lots of different things come along with it. Do you represent yourself, mate, or do you have somebody that represents you? So, so no, I'm, I'm right now. I do have people representing myself okay. uh, and and helping me out, like you just said, with all the either like you know social stuff, calendar, booking deals, and left and right. And it's been it's been quite useful, to be honest with you. I feel like, like you just said previously, you know, the, the truth is when you start the sport, uh, you just you're passionate about your sport, right? And that's what you want to be good at. That's what you want to showcase to the world. And that's what I've been doing for many many years now. But uh, as positive as it may be, sometimes other opportunities comes around and, you know, having people that can represent you, help you out, kind of guide you into a direction that you, you know, you're not necessarily familiar with that space is for me, was very helpful. So I had several experiences in the past with agencies or agent okay. and management firms for, for specifically either athletes or, you know, influencers, talents and stuff like that. But now, right now I do have a really, really solid team behind me. So it's uh, it's quite useful. Yeah. How conscious are you, Felix, of how important it is to maximize the opportunity that you have after an Olympic Games? Because we're in one of those sports, right, where the reality is people are only going to really watch or pay attention. And I'm talking about the wider public, so not the gymnastics fans, once every four years. How conscious are you of that? And and what are you? what is your approach in terms of trying to maximize that opportunity? So... To answer your first question, I'm I'm very conscious. I think it's it's a real deal for sure, specifically for Olympic athletes, specifically for 
gymnasts as a whole, like you said, you know, it's not necessarily like a professional sport where you can see soccer or hockey or football and stuff like that uh, evolve into a space where you get contract into the sport. I mean, we kind of do maybe with the Euro League, but it's not it's not exactly the same. Right. Yeah. And so knowing that, like you said, after the games, you have millions of people that just either watch you perform, watch you uh, do well or, or whatever happened. And then with the social media that comes around mm-hmm. it nowadays, especially, specifically if you look at Paris 2024, like the memes, the, yeah. you know, everything that happened, I feel like everything can blow up so easily in regards to the Olympic games when there's millions of people watching that as a, an athlete specifically competing in an individual sport, you kind of have to build yourself a brand, right? Yeah. And then you can then uh, really tr- truly profit off that and use that to either, you know, push yourself up forward into your career even if you keep doing gymnastics that's that's wonderful that's what i'm i'm going to be doing but you know one day we know as gymnasts you can't necessarily be performing until you're 50 right because because yeah. it's very hard on your body very hard on the, on, the, on the mental side and so i believe that when you're able to capitalize on those opportunities and those key moments such as the olympics and the post-olympic season that's where it can really i would say have a it can, it can kind of change your career, you know, wise, yeah. especially, you know, when we talk about after career, after gymnastics, and I think using that momentum to attending events, creating more social, uh, so, social content, and, and maybe you can see a sphere where you want to evolve later on after your gymnastics career. I feel that, I feel like I felt that after the games more than ever, I was kind of aware of it after like Pan Am games, but after the games was definitely something that it jumps to you, you know, it, it jumps to you. But it's good. I think it's good. It's interesting, mate, because I think there's a new crop of uh, talented young guys coming through that are very aware that almost they're approaching the sport like, right, I can't just be good at the sport. Strategically in that sense. I have to also have a brand and have a career. And I, I, mm-hmm. I'm interested to know where that, when that kind of awareness of, and maybe it's watching a gener- the generation before you, right? So maybe two generations before yourself. So Beijing, that Canadian team were quite successful around that, you know, 2004 to 2008. And then there was a bit of a drop off. Uh, and I used to train with those guys. A massive and, drop off, I'd yeah, say. Yeah, a big drop off. And I trained with those guys and they were good gymnasts, right? But results wise and teams qualifying for major events, it just wasn't happening. And it certainly wasn't happen- happening consistently. Did the awareness of you that, okay, if I'm going to have a career here and I'm also going to make money and I'm going to be able to do gymnastics for as long as possible, okay, I'm going to have to build a brand. I'm going to have to build something alongside just doing the gymnastics because the gymnastics isn't good and that on its own isn't enough for me anymore because I'm seeing the Mm -hmm. likes of Fred Richards in America doing the same thing yourself. Absolutely. You know, I'm constantly looking at guys online now that have got hundreds of thousands of followers on social media just by posting content online pushing up content and that's yeah. just not something that existed when i was a gymnast or an athlete it just didn't and if you actually go and look at a lot of the guys that were maybe just under my generation that are still training their followings online are not big they're you know in comparison to the new generation of people like yourself mm-hmm. that really have understood okay right i need to mm-hmm. tap into something here like tiktok youtube instagram like I need to do that. And that's almost part of my training. It's like an equal part of it. It it, it comes together, you know, and I feel like specifically to give you almost a date, a data point where I realized that this could be a big game changer. I went to the, and I think you did too, the youth Olympic games. Yep. Uh, Mine were in 2018, if if I'm not mistaken, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And, uh, you know, like I said previously, I started gymnastics because I, I, I loved it. I'm a very competitive kid. Uh, I wanted to win. I wanted to be good. I was talented and I, and I generally uh, loved it. And so when I showed up to these games, the only thing I had in mind was, you know, put up the best possible performances. Somehow maybe, you know, bring a medal home would be, would be legendary, would be wonderful. Right. And at that time, that was the, uh, by far the biggest event I've ever attended as an athlete. And so I, I competed there. I won uh, the silver on rings um at those games and i think i think after like one day after the you know the final the, the winning the winning the medal i think i gained like fifteen thousand followers at that time wow. in one day and i was like like geez this is crazy you know and i never really treated instagram or any of my social platform as a way to you know not sell myself or just like showcase myself more than that you know it was just like me posting as a regular like anybody just posting their daily, you know, stuff. And so when I saw that, 
I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy. You know, that's completely nuts. And then not too long afterwards, that's when I, I, I got approached by my first ever agency. Okay. And then I kind of got to understand the game, the good and the bad, I would say, because there's definitely both sides to it. And I kind of grew in that space a little bit and I kind of lost somewhat of a momentum because I feel like at that time I was around like, you know, six, 16 years old, I believe, um, 16, 17. And I was not ready yet, you know, to, mm. to really put in the work in that specific aspect. I had trouble to balance either, you know, school and gym and doing that. And like the coaches, you know, like their perspective on what you're doing in the gym, that's also a clash. And, you know, my coach is a Romanian coach. Like when you enter the the, the room, you're here to work, not here to film yourself, you know? Yeah. And that, that was something that came very specifically early on into that, you know, social media career. So it was, it was definitely a challenge to balance those lifestyle together. And then it slowly kind of grew on me throughout the years. It took time. It took also, you know, me gaining more knowledge and really, I would say doing what I love the most, right? Because I feel like, especially in a space, not only in a sport way, but on a social media aspect of things, there's so many things you can do. You know, you can create in so many ways, you can showcase your sport in so many different aspects of it. And I feel like but once you fan, once you really found something that you like, mm -hmm. that resonate with yourself, with your values, uh, your morals, and you kind of genuinely like creating it, it's much more easy, you know, it's to be consistent, to, to do something that looks nice, that feels appealing, and that you're just overall satisfied with, right? So I feel like once I found that, it was much more easy for me to, you know, pump out this content and really showcase myself and my sport to the world. And then that's when it becomes somewhat profitable in the end. It's really but, interesting, yeah. mate, because I would say that you're probably one of the, you know, when I was competing, uh, I was somebody that like studied the sport. So I knew what everybody was doing everywhere because I was just obsessed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say that you were one of the kids that was probably one of the first kids I remember watching being almost like uh, like an internet kind of like super next superstar. I can remember <laughs> watching videos of you when you were very young, at, like Canadian championships yeah. and be like, whoa, this kid's good. You know, and like people would talk in the gym. Have you seen that kid from there? And then there'd be there'd be guys from all over the world, right? Like similar. You'd have yeah. like videos of Yule when he was very young doing triple doubles off high bar and stuff. And like people yeah, yeah, always yeah. see or Jake Jarman doing crazy. You'd see that, and I'd say you were what you were probably that generation. Would you yeah. say the same thing in that you were one of the first your age group, the first age group to grow up with the internet the whole time being in gymnastics. And what were the positives of that? And then maybe what were the negatives, Felix? Because for me, when I was growing up, the only person I could rely on as a reference point was my coach. I couldn't see what my competitors were doing until I turned up to the competition and then I knew what skills they were doing. Whereas like, I imagine when you were growing up, a lot of the guys, a lot of your friends were posting videos on the internet all the time of their training. So you kind of always knew what level you needed to be at. So what were the positives of growing up with the internet and having that access to basically the whole world's library of gymnastics content? Uh, and maybe what mm -hmm. were the negatives? I would say, I mean, for, first of all, yeah, I, I think we definitely were one of the first generation to grew into the sport with this whole social media slash inter inter internet thing all the way since we kind of, you know, picked up the junior years and then into the seniors. Uh, I mean, I would say one of the positive side, like you said, is to be able to see what the competitors are doing or practicing. It's almost like a way of learning. You know, I remember, I vividly remember one of the athletes that I now do train with almost every single day. At that time, he was based in Vancouver, somewhere else in Canada, quite far away. And I remember on Facebook, I saw him for the first time. He was about 16. He's a little bit older than me. I was probably like 13. Uh, he caught Kovac for the first time, posted on Facebook. And I was like, no way, you know, this is crazy. He caught Kovac, like what a crazy skill. And then it really motivated me and pushed me that day to start learning Kovacs, right? Yeah. And I did, like I, I literally went to the gym. I told my coach, like, I really want to try this. Like, I'm sure I can pull it off. Like I, I look at the video, I analyzed it, look at the angles and stuff. And I feel like, I, I, yeah, I feel like it's doable. And then from there, I went on into practicing it a lot. And it definitely became one of my most successful skill on a high bar. You know, I developed my high bar around those releases uh, at a younger, younger age, right? And I think without that video, it might not have been exactly mm -hmm. that you know, the same. So I feel like that was definitely a positive output. And on the other hand, it's like, we know, we know social media is, is a, like, there's always two sides to a coin, right? But when you look at social media, you only see one. So mm -hmm. the thing is, 
if we look in the sport and other athletes posting, you know, their victories or their skills or their, you know, achievements, I feel like you always need to take things with a grain of salt, but that goes, that goes for any ways for anything on social media. And I think we all understand that. And so sometimes I, I, I could remember a time where like, you know, you have, it, it's harder. You're like not feeling your best physically, mentally in the gym, your career is kind of taking a little pivot. You have an injury or whatsoever. And then you just open your phone and everybody's, you know, doing well, doing well, you know, training and, and, and performing and getting better every single day. And you just feel like you're stagnating, right? Mm -hmm. You're just staying there. You're struggling with some stuff and that can be, that can be detrimental, right? That can be, that can be difficult to deal with because you, if you feel like the whole world is getting ahead of you while you're just on, on the sideline, just waiting, waiting for something to happen waiting for, for you to feel better. So I, I feel like I said, it's, it's this double-sided knife, but Honestly, I feel like once you understand the game, mm -hmm. which for me took time, yeah. definitely took time. But once you understand the game, you see where people are placed at and how it's played. It's really, really easy and useful to kind of take it and just use those advantages and not get those kind of downsided things about the Internet. Because like the truth is, there's always positive and negative everywhere. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not black and white. It's kind of grayish. Uh, area in life but i feel like you know once you really understand it you can use it to your personal benefit but also to you know benefit your the cause or benefit your your sport like i said benefit all the all the good stuff so yeah but it takes time time, time and experience makes the difference do you see now younger athletes that you train with or maybe train in your gym felix or in the canadian junior team do you see them making any mistakes and not necessarily that they would be mistakes but is there anything you see them doing and the way that they're using social media you think ah, oh, maybe you shouldn't do that or maybe you should wait until mm. you're a bit older or you should avoid doing that is there anything that you're seeing that because i remember um probably towards the end of my career there was uh probably i'd say two generations before me I remember these guys would you know because i grew up without any funding without any money mm. we were, in some ways yeah. we were in a, a far worse position than Team Canada have been for the past 10 years, right? Like we was 23rd best team, we were miles away. So we didn't have any money. My parents had to pay for us to go to training camps. And then all of a sudden, like 10 years later, I see these kids coming in at like 16, 17 with like thousand pound Canada goose coats on and Balenciaga <laughs> trainers on. And I'm looking like, what's going They've not done anything yet. What This seems odd. There's something <laughs> wrong here. Like I can remember that time oh, thinking, mm, it's going to be interesting to see how many of these guys ride it out until they're seniors and go yep. on to have careers yep. and you know some of them have but many of them haven't uh mm -hmm. is there anything you're seeing from maybe the generation below you that you're like mm, i'm not sure about that so, so first of all i'd say regarding social media i feel like it's very difficult even for me to kind of give pointers even though I, I i do but to give specific pointers to younger generation because i feel like every single athlete nowadays is so different from one another in terms of career wise and what they want to do for themselves that like, sometimes I'm like, I can't, I don't feel really entitled to tell somebody else what to do because I personally had a very specific vision of what I wanted for my sports career and, and social media career. And it's like, in my head, if you're not specifically where I want to be, I don't really feel like I should take all your advice for, you know, for what it is. Yeah. That's just how, that's just how I feel about it. So if somebody's like, listen, Felix, I don't really want to be where you are right now. I would say like, then that's completely fair for you not to just buy into what I'm telling you. Right. Yeah. But you know, like you just said, the truth is Canada was in a very bad place, you know, financially for the whole, specifically for the men's program for, for years now. Right. And when you see specifically younger guys, cause you know, they don't have as much experience and, when you see them getting the carding or, or, or the, the financial support or somewhat I have financial success throughout their career in a specifically early stage, you do, of course, you know, see multiple mistakes that are being made. And, you know, as you probably know, you're an older, you have a bunch of experience. And now I kind of gained a little bit of experience, too. We know that these good days or these good times don't always come mm. around every every year right so it's very important to understand that and that you know sports success are sometimes a cycle yeah. and once the cycle drops on the red side then hey buddy it's 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 over you know it's over you might want to step back a little bit because if you if you just go crazy and you, you you live that big life for too long without necessarily 
you know, making sure you, you, I mean, you, you lock yourself in a solid position where you're like, okay, I can go one or two years without having that massive success. Then you, you're, you're in a danger zone, right? Literally you're in a yeah. danger zone because if you don't, uh, if you don't clutch it and you don't get that financial support the next year around, I mean, you know, you might be in trouble, but that's definitely something that happened, you know, I, and I think that's something that happened in every single countries. But the reality is that in Canada, if you don't get, I would say a combination of both sports success and any sort of social media endorsement or, you know, work endorsement or stuff like that, the chances are you won't really get enough financial support to even go that crazy. So that, that, that's just what it is. But I mean, I, I've seen most of the guys here that I'm training with being supported by, you know, their families for years and years and years. So I feel like w- once you see your parents devote everything they have for you yeah. to be successful, you automatically build some kind of respect towards this achievement you will eventually get uh, if you do in the sport. And I feel like per- personally for me, that was definitely a big game changer. You know, I've seen my parents go through hell for me to be able to even just train and, and, and compete. And it was definitely not easy from time to time, but I feel like because I went through this with them, I can definitely sit here now and, and really respect what I've earned and what I've got and be able to, you know, stay low, enjoy what I have and keep working for more. And, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we don't block any blessings. That's, that's really how I go about it because I think like sometimes it can, especially when it comes down to social media, it can kind of go up to your head and yeah. and it goes crazy and you lose it. Yeah. So it must be, be difficult. You know, I can't imagine I never had that experience at 16, having 15,000 followers overnight. That's quite hard yeah. for your brain to kind of comprehend, right? You, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You're basically not supposed to be able to. No, exactly. It's like a that. boost of adrenaline, dopamine yeah. and, you know. Yeah. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask me, uh, did you have the typical, were you the typical mold of a gymnast when you started out? So were you that hyperactive kid that got into gymnastics? Was that your story? Uh, And then if I was going to, if I was going to come to your gym when you were 15 or 16 and sit and watch a session, what would I see from you, mate? What type of physically, what would I see? What your talents and then mentally, what would I see from the kind of mindset and the approach? Mm -hmm. What were you like as a young athlete? Yeah. So like you said, I was really that kid who <laughs> I was extremely excited jumping everywhere. My, my story basically began when I was doing uh, team sport, right? Like hockey and and, and, and soccer. I, I believe you guys call it football. Sorry. Yeah, we call oh, it football. Geez. Soccer's fine, mate. We understand it. <laughs> okay. Okay, great, great. And uh, but yeah, so my parents were like, God, this kid is way too, you know, way too energetic. He needs some kind of outlet uh, more than what he already has. And You know, they put me in gymnastics and the only thing I hated and I I quote hated about team sport is 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 the team aspect (laughs) specifically. uh, I I like to do my things kind of not necessarily on my own, but when it comes down to being very competitive, I like to rely on my own actions. Right. And so when I found out about gymnastics and I fall into it, the competitive aspect was brilliant. Like for me, it definitely matched my energy to 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 the perfect T. And then the fact of like, you know, flying onto the ball on, 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 in the air and flying on the bars and doing all that sort of stuff was so um, new, you know, so unique, so crazy to me. And looking at the guys and the, we all we all watch those YouTube videos, like montage of like, like Olympics back in like 20, 26 years ago is, you know, it's crazy motivating. You see those guys crazy physique doing insane doesn't even look human to me and i was like sitting there at like seven or eight i was like this is so crazy right with that little music in the background felt so motivated and so i really got into gymnastics uh full on uh, as almost as soon as i got uh and i started training it and then my i would say my mentality was a very not a harsh competitor but I loved being the best. Like that was really me, you know, being younger. I was like, I just wanted to do two more chin-ups than you just so I knew, you know, I had a little <laughs> edge. So, but my, but my coach saw that as soon as I, you know, started and he really used it. He really used it. It was always, you know, challenging me, pushing me to the, to the extremes of level. And like I said previously, you know, c- coming from Romania, my coach was very, uh, 
very straight into his approach of gymnastics, to say the least. I, I believe you also have a... Your, your, isn't your coach Russian? Uh, my coach was Russian. I did have... My first national coach was Romanian. I've been around Romanian coaches. There are quite yeah, a lot yeah, of Romanian okay. coaches in the UK as well, so uh, I'm but sure... But Eastern Europe, you know, you, but you know Eastern how Europe, mate. Yeah, so my, my upbringing was probably very similar to yourself, so... Uh, yeah, yeah tough, absolutely. Tough. So, yeah, so he definitely saw that in me, and he used it to the maximum uh, possible to like push me, motivate me, because he knew, you know, in the end, I was ready to go and do anything just to be the best, right? Just to win. So I started my first competition, I think ever. I ended up being second overall. And that was like a fire for me. That was like, wow, second, no shot, never again, you know, I'll be second. <laughs> and then I, I kept pushing even harder with him. And it definitely uh, paid off in the sense where I was also quite talented. You know, I, everything that goes along like flipping and twisting such as you know floor vault was something that came quite easily for me and then even if you look at rings i didn't have too much struggle to build a somewhat reasonable uh, body strength ratio at a young age so everything that was you know plunge presses uh, i could i could do those quite easily so when you look at you know the early junior career it's very useful because yeah. most of the guys are still kind of developing that you know body strength ratio um but yeah, so you, yeah, you would definitely have seen a guy that was jumping everywhere, extremely competitive. Uh, I would say, yeah, my, my, my best events were definitely floor involved for the longest time when I was younger. Uh, and I loved practicing them. It was just, just very enjoyable, right? And then I would say I, I was struggling maybe a little bit more on P-bars, pummel horse, uh, but I was still practicing them quite a lot. Like I was, I was really an all-arounder as, you know, as long as I can remember. And my mm -hmm. coach was something that he really hang on to he's like he, we're doing all the rounders here like there's yeah. no trying to do one events or three or four and then growing up i would say around the age of 12 to 13 i was definitely well rounded where i had all my events being very very i would say respectful start value decent execution and i i was definitely building my way up there as a as a strong junior nationally but i would even say you know internationally after competing in like uh, Austria and 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 then Berlin and all those uh, European competitions, and then as we all know, you become a teenager and a bunch of stuff about your body changed. And so for me, it was mostly like my wrist, my elbows, and my shoulders were definitely the biggest struggle I ever had mm -hmm. in my gymnastics career. And then like to this day, you know, it still kind of impact me. But that's that's what you would have seen the most, I'd say so, in the gym <laughs> of me. And what would you say didn't? maybe didn't come so naturally to you would it be pommel horse would it be parallel bars what where, what was an area that you struggled in you know for me personally when i was younger you know i was i was very good all round but particularly up until the age of about 14 i was very good on five events and struggled massively on pommel horse and i had mm -hmm. to do a lot of a lot of work on pommel so i trained like double time on pommel horse and eventually it became a strength, but it was always something that didn't necessarily come naturally to me in the beginning. And as I got older, rings became a bit more challenging because I struggled with my shoulders. Um, it always sounds funny when I say this to someone that's not a gymnast, but I've got short body, long legs. So rings was yeah. doing Maltese and planche was tricky for me. What were the things that you struggled with um, as a teenager? Where were those areas that you had to spend more time? I would say, I'm kind of ashamed to say it, but, you know, definitely growing up at like to the teens all the way up to my senior year, definitely pummel horse was my weakest event. But the thing is, you know, when I was younger, I didn't necessarily like practicing pummel horse, but I was quite good at it since okay. I had, you know, I, I was small. I still had some good, you know, shoulder flexibility range and my wrist, specifically my wrist were fine. You know, at that time I could do a lot of circles and I was doing like, you know, I think I learned how to do like Stockley flop when I was like, like 11 you know and i was doing like like decent stockley flop decent start value and all that stuff and then magger shavato uh, handstand dismount like i was quite talented even on pummelers for, for for a really younger athlete and then came the day where i really it really i think it was 12 to 13 range fractured both of my wrist um multiple fracture on my grill plates and same thing happened to my shoulders and so it, it really all came at once, mm. which completely killed all mobility I had in my wrist. And to this day, like I, I probably have one of the worst wrists, like gymna gymnast wrists ever, I believe. At least I've, I've rarely seen people with my wrist. And so 
it really kind of just completely blocked me from being able to train and mm. just simply swing around pommel horse freely. So I would literally, you know, after taking out my, my cast and, and, and all my stuff and trying to have somewhat of a recovery program, I would say, you know, I would swing on pommel horse for like three circles, maybe wow. like on, on, on the, on the leather itself. And I would like, like, I would be, out of 10, like probably sitting on like a nine or no eight out of 10 pain, like, like crazy, like crazy, crazy. Like I couldn't barely, you know, bear the pain. It was, it was unbelievable. Right. And I, I, I kept pushing through, kept doing, trying to do more circles, use, you know, wrist supports and Advils. And we know, we all know, you know, <laughs> how, where, where that rabbit hole goes, but it, it was definitely a huge, huge struggle for me as soon as I, you know, really hopped into my teens and start growing up and all the other events, you know, I was managing it, you know, I was managing it. P-bars was definitely something that was painful, not as much as pommel horse, but I was still managing it. And I was still like working on like, you know, under bars was something that was not as bad. So I put more time into this yeah. and I was still able to develop a very, you know, respectful P-bar routine, but I feel like pommel horse was so hard to get around because simply putting my support up was something i was like damn this is this is unbearable you know this is unbearable i was waking up in the morning trying to putting my my hand down flat on the table was impossible to me like i could I, I couldn't right like if i wanted to do push-ups it was on my fist if i wanted to do to, the, to a point where like opening a door was quite painful so you know <laughs> i would say that was the most challenging thing i had to go through in my early or, or teen career yeah. but to this day that's certainly something that impacted me because if you look at my you know general all-around scores pommel horse is the, the main event you know really really tanking me down for for for, for my, my, my all-around basically yeah. and so that's been something you know i've been trying to work on for, for for several years now and we're still doing it right now and i've never you know i'm a very confident guy very motivated guy so i don't lose hope on that topic it's simply that it's a reality that i know yeah. i'm dealing with but i'll just you know keep doing my best keep pushing my best and eventually it will it, it, it will come up it will come up I, I don't doubt that so you must have been around other gymnasts uh, at that time, Felix, when you were having that extreme pain in your wrist, that gave up, right? You know, oh, being sure. a gymnast now, at the, you know, you've, you've been to the Olympic Games, you're well experienced. When you look back in hindsight, what do you think is the difference, like the, the key ingredient between the kids that give up and the kids that push through that pain? Because you could have quite easily stopped, right? Like, oh, absolutely. the signs were there that, okay, he's, yeah. this is extreme pain, he's only a kid. We don't know whether he's going to go to the Olympic Games or not. Like, it would be quite mm -hmm. justified for you to walk away at that point. What do you think is that mm -hmm. key ingredient, in your opinion? Because you will have seen this now, time and time again, by watching younger athletes go through that process. What do you think Absolutely. is that thing that separates the, uh, the, the kids that keep going and the kids that give up? It's funny enough you say this because, right, I would say two, a year and a half to two years after I took out my cast to my wrist, I used to train, we used to have like a group of guys, right? Training together when I was very young, guys that were always we like same age almost and really pushing together. And we had that one guy, he was a, literally a pommel specialist at like 12. He was extremely talented, very, very good. He was one year older than me, extremely talented. One of the best in the country at like four, 13 or 14 years old in terms of talent on pommel horse. And he basically had very similar issues on his wrist, his right wrist. I had both of mine, but he, he had the same on his right wrist. And that's what happened with him, right? He gave, he gave up uh, afterwards, never, was never able to come back as strong as he was, and he, he, he gave up. But for me, I think the difference between his mentality and mine at that time and to this day, uh, and I would say the general athlete that kind of goes through a massive struggle and then wants to maybe come back, but then doesn't really make it, it's, it might sound cliche, might sounds very large in terms of terms, but I would say it's the, it's the drive, you know, the drive, the ambition, the fire. It's like, like for me, like I can't even not fathom a life without gymnastics, but it's like, I'm so used to it. It's what I love to do. And I remember as a like 10 years old kid telling my parents and my coach that I will go to the Olympics. So how, like, how can I just say, damn, my wrist hurt and just bail away? Like, that's just not me. That's like, I, I just can't even live with myself at this point. If I would do this, to, it's to that extent, right? Yeah. I'm not saying it's what everybody should be like, because I don't believe that 
the professional level, the top level is meant for everyone. I, I truly do not believe that. Some people are just not interested into it and that's fine. Do I believe anybody can achieve some type of greatness? Absolutely. But I feel like when it comes to very, very high level sport, you have to be somewhat, you know, something's not going completely right. You know, you're very, very driven. <laughs> Slightly extreme. You, you, yeah, exactly. It's very extreme. You know, it's very extreme. And some people might call it unhealthy. Uh, I'll, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll be like, yeah, maybe, but I, I mean, I love it. You know, I, I, I genuinely love it. And, uh, I, I feel healthy into it. You know, I, I feel like, of course, some, from time to time, I do feel somewhat unhealthy, but most of the time it makes me happy, right? It makes me happy and, and I feel healthy with it. And so that specific drive, I feel like, you know, the world could come crashing down and I would still wake up in the morning and feeling like I can make it, you know, somehow. I can feel that. So, I feel that energy off you, that drive. That's the word I yeah. would probably use to describe um, yeah. just meeting you but that's now definitely in this something, conversation. Yeah. yeah, but that's definitely something I'm trying to I'm trying to share, you know, to people and to either younger athletes, but even people that are not necessarily engaged into sport. Because I've seen like throughout the years, I had the chance to kind of go through life with a bunch of different successful people that are not like not necessarily gymnastics related, but I can I can feel and see this um, this really common theme where when you're almost ad, like you're addicted to it, right? It's like you you have that drive, that fire fire in you that just makes you go forward no matter what, right? You might fall down, you might you know have an injury, you might have a massive failure, but because you have that little fire in you, you're like you know what. Yeah. bite the bullet and I'll go at it again. Right. And that's really something I'm trying to share to the, to the people, because I believe it's like a secret weapon to life. It's like, you literally can go through life, go through as many as challenges you want, the, the biggest, the failure, but you can still, you know, rise up, get back up. It might take some time. It might take some effort, of course, because everything good comes with time and effort, but it's possible. Right. But once you have this in your mind, you're like, I'm good. You know, I'm, I'm literally yeah. good. As soon as I apply that. It's so, a really interesting yeah. message. And I think it's a valuable one, mate. Uh, and I, did you see Nike's um, Nike's promotional stuff around the Olympic Games when it was mm -hmm. they kind of did a promotional thing around like winners, because I think yeah. you yeah, know yeah. in recent years there's been a lot of particularly in the UK right but and people talk about it and they make a bigger deal of it but there there's kind of like participation medals and like yeah. Yeah. celebrating people that are super successful or relentless yeah. or very competitive it's a very negative thing. Absolutely. And I think we've got into a position Absolutely. where like telling kids that is not necessarily like, you know, some kids, it's a good thing for them to be driven and to be competitive and to want to win because ultimately life is like that. Like we can pretend it's not, but it's a competition. That's what this is. Yeah, and as exactly. soon, and if you've been told your whole life until you're 18, that no, everybody is just taking, it's taking part that counts and everybody's nice and it's fair. And as soon as you get to 18 and you come into the real world, you realize very quickly, mm. oh no, it's not, mm -hmm. not everything's fair and I don't just get my way. So it's a good message. I think that you're sharing there, mate. I think the word that I, I've noticed that as well, I think I would call it relentlessness it's like a relentlessness mm -hmm. just and from you saying that you wanted to do two if somebody did 10 or you just wanted to prove that you'd beat the other guy i think it's very difficult to beat somebody like that and i think they can almost i feel like when i was younger um and this uh, i went through a probably a a roller coaster of kind of i would say a mindset to be honest i was very much like yourself i think until the age of about mm -hmm probably the age of about 21, 22, 23. And then I kind of, my confidence took a real knock. But up until that point, I think I could overwhelm people with just my relentlessness of, I'm just going to keep going to try and beat you. I'm going to beat you eventually and you're going to give up yeah. because it's just going to exactly. be overwhelming. And I, I think, you know, I, I'm kind of feeling that from you, that energy. What was it like when you probably, I imagine, had a lot of success in Canada as a junior and were probably one of the top guys, if not the top guy for a long time. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden you're now in the senior ranks and you're competing internationally against all of the best gymnasts in the whole world. What was that step up in levels like? I mean, like you said, it's definitely in some kind of way performing in Canada for me was always like, and that might sound kind of bad saying this, but it's not a big deal. But like, as soon as I was very, very young, my coach was like, listen, Felix, you have talent. Okay, that's cool. Uh, it's not enough. You need to work harder. If you really want to be good, it, actually, if you want to be great, 
you need to work. Like that's, that's what's going to separate you from the masses because the truth is one day you'll be facing other kids, same age, and even maybe younger that have even more talent than you. So how are you going to, you know, surpass them? It's, it's, it's only going to be through work and work ethic. So at that point, he really put a point and like a step onto me and my team going internationally as soon as possible, very, very young juniors to see those guys, to see those talented kids either work extremely hard and beat us or work extremely hard and not beat us and to see like where we could really face off against them. And so I think my first international competition, which is extremely important, I believe in a, in a, you know, young gymnast career to go internationally as soon as possible, I think it was around my um, 12th birthday or something like this. I went to Europe for the first time competed <clears throat> and it was brilliant. It was definitely brilliant. I saw that I was definitely one of the best uh, I, I can't recall if I, you know, won the all around. I, I definitely won several medals, several gold medals, but I was definitely up there, you know, up there amongst the best. And so it definitely boosted my, my, my ego and boosted my, my vision of myself as an athlete, gave me a lot of confidence, even though I probably had enough at that time already, but it definitely boosted it even more, even further. But I feel like, you know, when I slowly, you know, grew up and I went to the youth Olympic games, for example, when I was 16 years old, I was faced with a kid, same age as me, probably two foot smaller than me, winning every single of the events, right? That was uh, Takeru Kitazono, who is a Japanese kid, of course. And, uh, you know, coming in here and just killing everybody, right? Like literally doing some not only beautiful gymnastics, but insane, insanely difficult gymnastics at the age of 16 years old. Mm. And that definitely like, wow, for me, that was like one of the first time where, you know, getting my ass absolutely whooped on most of the events was like a humbling experience, you know, humbling experience. And you see this happening and you're like, okay, okay. There's more to my little province or my little country out there. That definitely, you know, yeah, even, even more than Europe to say the least. And it, it, it didn't kill my confidence. I feel like it more so, you know, pushed me to be better, yeah. but into some kind of extent, you realize that there's always going to be someone out there putting the work, no matter what you do. Like right now we're talking right, like later I'll be eating and late at night I'll be sleeping, but there's somewhere around the world, someone that is very talented and is putting the work right now to surpass you. And that's what came to my mind after this event. Right. And I started thinking like that every single day. So as soon as I wasn't necessarily putting effort into moving forward into my gymnastics career, I was realizing and reminding to myself that somebody was, mm every single day trying to get ahead of me. And so that was kind of, uh, that was, that was, that was pretty extreme at that time, but I feel like it kind of pushed me even more to develop myself and to make sure I wasn't going to get like too, not cocky in a sense, but yeah, cocky for no reason. Cause I believe people that are very confident being confident and cocky is two different things, right? Yeah. Cocky is when you can't really show for it, but I didn't want to be that guy. I wanted to have my confidence, but be able to show something for it and have, owned it into some kind of sense. And so that's only by putting out, you know, massive work. And so I started doing this more and more and more. And then, you know, once you get uh, higher into the ranks of seniors and then you show up onto bigger events, you know, world championship, world cups, you meet a bunch of other guys that are extremely talented. Some of them are, uh, you know, world finalist, Olympic finalist, Olympic medalist. And then you're like, wow, okay, there's, there's level to this thing. You know, there's level to this thing. But I feel like for me, it was always a big source of motivation. Of course, at some point, I feel like I also, I feel like I, I took a hit of reality because, you know, you understand that there's a bunch of guys into the USA, for example, there's like a pond of millions of, of people that can go into gymnastics, then develop themselves. And you look at like Canadians as a team and it's like, oh, damn, there's only like maybe a couple of thousands of kids a year that practice gymnastics in the country and even like that, like even thousands, probably way, way, way less than that. But so you kind of understand life as it is, right? Mm -hmm. And into the sport and you, you you gain knowledge, you gain experience. But for me, most of it was all, always a source of massive motivation. And I still do believe like fundamentally, if I want to become Olympic medalist, I will, right? And that's definitely one of my goal. But I feel like growing up, like anything in life, you just understand more and yeah. you just become somewhat realistic. I don't like to say that word, but it's just the truth. And then, but it doesn't kill the, it doesn't kill the, you know, the fire or the ambition behind it. But I feel like being able to really manage those high on confidence slash, oof, I took a 
reality hit is somewhat important because you understand the sport, you're going to understand yourself more. And then one day you'll be probably a senior looking to perform in, you know, the world championship and in the Olympics and being able to understand the world around you, the competitors around you and being very transparent with this will allow you to actually obtain your, your, your full potential. Cause if you, if you're not transparent with yourself and you're aligning yourself every single day, it's, it's, it's tough. I think it's tough to really develop. You know, when you talked about when you were younger, Felix, you wanted to kind of be everybody else. Mm -hmm. Are you now more, do you feel like your approach now is more in that you're trying to be the best that you can be rather focusing on the other people? <clears throat> and is, have you gone through that process? Uh, and would so, you say that's almost like a maturity thing? Because uh, I was the same when I was younger. I wanted to beat everybody, right? But I think towards the end of my career, it w I still wanted to beat them. But like my job, my job was to I was competing with myself all the time. I was trying. I was seeing what I could do. Like how good could I be? You know? Does that make sense? So I, it makes it makes total sense. I would say when you say a, a maturity thing, I would say most likely, definitely, yeah. But at the same time, I will honestly be lying to myself and would sit here and tell you that just wanting to be better than I was yesterday would make me the happiest guy. I would say that, that for me, that would be a lie because like I said, it's so deeply rooted into me. The fact that I want to be like, I, I want to win, you know, I want to, I want to be the best. And I truly believe that if I become the best possible version of myself, I will be the best. Like I will, you know, obtain what I want and I will still achieve the fact that I can beat everybody else. But there's two realities to this thing. And I do understand it. And I do see it very, very vividly. But I feel like, I feel like it's, it's tough to just sit down and say, okay, if I'm just better than I was yesterday, like it, it sounds good. And I'm not saying it's bad. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying if, if somebody see it that way, I feel like it's perfectly honest. But for me, there's a part of myself that is like, ah, man, you're, you're kind of lying to yourself. Let's be honest here. Like it's, it's great, but you're kind of lying to yourself. If, if, if that soul thing mm. would fulfill all your ambitions but at the same time it is a truth you know it is a truth i think some days some days you have to take that win as hey listen man i was better than i was yesterday we'll take that as a win you know and that's where my my personal maturity really comes into play is being able to switch into the right mode in the right times yeah. because some days man it's just not your time OK, it's just and that's just how it is. You know, so some some things you can't control, some things you can't control. But you have to understand that, hey, if today wasn't your day, it doesn't mean like you're, you're you know, you're you're a done deal. It doesn't mean it won't happen. But hey, that's just that's just life. So if it was a little bit better than yesterday, take it as a win. But maybe in two weeks when you show up on that on, on that floor, I go up with that mentality is like, listen, if I don't beat every single other athletes here, I won't be satisfied, right? I'm going for like a 14.8. I'm going for a 14.9. I have to stick every single line or else this this isn't it, you know? But yeah, that, that's for, that for me, that's extreme mentality is also a way to push myself because yeah. even technically, if I don't even reach that, you know, 14.8 and stick in every single line and I stick four lines out of five out of six and I score 14.7 or 14.6, it's somewhat still a reasonable score that can still allow me to like go into final, make a medal, which still, quote for quote, looks good, but not necessarily will fulfill everything, if I can say so. That competitiveness that is, you know, you're very outwardly spoken about it. Has that ever got yeah. you into trouble in terms of, because I can remember being quite a competitive kid myself and other kids don't necessarily like that at times. Absolutely. So you can end up becoming quite isolated, right? Was, were you someone that was outwardly competitive? So you would show it, you were emotional. Or were you someone that keeps that competitiveness and that self-confidence? Do you internalize it? I'll give you a good example. I'd say Max Whitlock is probably one of the most competitive people I've mm. ever met, but you would never know it because it's mm -hmm. all inside his head. So I used to think when, when people would try to get under his skin, and sometimes they were our teammates, right? <laughs> when they would try to do that, I'd think, why are you doing that? You're just going to wind him up. Like, he's yeah, almost yeah. like a You're quiet... Just charge the battery, he's like bro. a quiet type. Yeah. Don't just leave him. You're poking the bear. Just don't do that because that will make him want to beat you so much more. What, were you, yeah, what yeah. were you like, Felix? What are you like? And does that at times get you into trouble, that competitiveness? Because it can be quite abrasive, right? Like, people aren't used yeah. to that sometimes. I would say definitely when I was younger, I was, I was very more, more so out loud with it in a sense where people could definitely see it. People could definitely see it. And it, and it, 
I wouldn't necessarily say it got me into trouble, but I definitely got some people, you know, against me in that sense because I and I do understand it, man. Like, listen, you have that kid. He's talking big. He wants to make it big. Maybe you don't see the reasoning behind it, and you just don't like his face. You know, like, like for me, that's totally acceptable, and I can see it. Uh, but I never really cared. I, I'm, I'm, I was always that type of kid who was like in his own world and never really cared about people's opinion in general. And I feel like that was one of my biggest strengths. You know, I felt like the people that really, really mattered to me in my life were always by my side. And the rest, like, I could not care less. Like, I kind of had so much confidence into my line, into where, like, my little little line where I was going, that, like, everything from the side, I just couldn't give a single, you know? I was, I, I was completely fine with them liking me, not liking me. Like, I was, you know, do your thing, do your thing. But as I grew older, I feel like I definitely became a little bit more, like, even though now I'm telling you up front, because I'm just that type of guy, you know, I just... I'm very straight with my vision, especially when I speak. Uh, I say things as as they are and as I feel like them. But now I would more so say that I'm more quiet into it when it comes to being with a team and, and competing internationally. Like you, you won't really see me necessarily talk too loud about this just because now that I'm older, I do really understand that – I don't really necessarily even myself believe into words. I do believe way more into actions and mm -hmm. that's what I want to display to the world. You know, I feel like saying, saying something and doing it is awesome. Looks really nice. It's, it's beautiful. But the truth is if you talk a little too much and you can't really make it happen, that kind of discredits, discredits your, your, you know, your voice and, and, yeah. and what you say in general. So sometimes I just rather do the work. I just, I just rather do the work. And then, you know, if somebody comes up to me and is like, wow, this is crazy. I'm like, yeah, well, that's that was the, that was just the goal, right? That was yeah. we were going for this. So, um, what would be crazier is what I'm going to do next, right? And that, and that's it. But like, not necessarily just put too much sauce on top of it. I feel like, and especially in days where you know social media and everything like entertaining is so big, I feel like people really like that. So you can use it or you cannot. But I feel like I want to be as true and as transparent as possible. So if somebody really would come up to me generally and ask me, I would tell them. But I wouldn't just you know. Yeah. Uh, gonna force it on people. Talk, talk, talk for no reason. Yeah. I, I'd rather show it. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the system in Canada that you have right now, mate? And, and whether that changed at some point that has, that you feel has led to the success you guys have began to build over the last few years? Mm, absolutely. So in my early career, when I started being a junior, we had, you know, two national coaches at that time. We had one junior national coach that was, you know, taking charge of the juniors and then the same for the seniors, right? Okay. And so I remember very clearly that the federation was definitely not in a good space um, since, you know, n not very, <laughs> no teams were qualifying for the Olympics, which meant for no funding or very, very few and no medals, no world results. And this is like a vicious circle, right? It's like a very vicious circle because the fact is, uh, if the team doesn't get funding, there's no training camp and there's no resources for athletes to develop in the space. And if that's the case, then most likely the athletes won't develop. And if they don't, then they probably won't qualify, which means for even less funding and then it goes around. And so I feel like the big, big game changer for me, but also for the system itself, was the fact that here in Quebec, the province, um, we were able to build a federation that really gathers people that believe in themselves and believe that it was possible to do it without the federal, like the, the federal, uh, team, you know, okay. without the Canadian federation behind it, backing it every day, right. backing the funding. So we literally kind of took on ourselves as a province to simply, gather around the best athletes, create training camps the way we can, as best as we can to allow the kids and to allow the potentials to actually develop themselves into full-fledged athletes. And I think if we ramp, ramp that up even more closely, we look at my specific club in Laval with my coach specifically, he was able to build literally four, uh, sorry, uh, three out of the five uh, Olympic athletes that were there in Paris, right? Really? Wow. So so like we really you know we had very specific goal in mind we were extremely driven from years and years before these 
you know, these achievement happen. It took, it took us years, but I feel like every single time we would show in competition or try a training camp, we would always kind of gain an edge, gain an edge and just slowly climbing that ladder until we were able to say, okay, we can, you know, safely say we're going to the Pan Am games for respectful results. And then we can safely say we're going to world championship, trying to have a, a, an all around final and an event final, and then maybe a team final. Yeah. And then, but that really just took some time. But I feel like the process was so difficult because the country itself didn't really engage that much. They were like, ah, you know, we're in a bad spot. What could we really do? Let's just sit down and see what comes from the sky, right? And I'm not a really firm believer that miracles just fall from the sky. So when we took it on ourselves, it definitely made a change. It took time, but it definitely happened, right? And I think now, as of today, we're definitely sitting on a better place because we, you know, we, 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 we built a team, we built something that was concrete and was able to somewhat deliver better results than we were in the past. But again, like I'm sitting here in front of you saying, am I actually completely satisfied of what happened in, in Paris in the team final? The truth is, I think we could have done better. I think we could have done better. Is it still a uh, historical moment for Team Canada being an, an Olympic team final? Absolutely. You know, it's never been done. So like I said, it's it's not the complete victory. We'll still take the W because it's better than it's better than what we've done, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like again, I was like, you know, when we left Paris on the eighth eighth spot on the team, I was like, damn, like it's it's cool and all, but bitter taste, you know, a little, little bit bit bitter taste. But I mean, the whole game just kind of came with that. But but yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. We're sitting at a better place right now. Yeah, it's very interesting how you talk about that because I would say we maybe there was a somewhat similar situation in the UK in that uh, we had a club in Nottingham where we had two Russian coaches come over that ended up being the two Russian national coaches, uh, and we built a very six they built along with the guy that owned the gym at the time a very successful mm -hmm. junior program in uh, our club. So at one point, twenty five percent of all of the gymnasts on the British team were from that club. Uh, and it was a very successful junior program. Um, and they, they basically took that model to the GB setup. And then because yeah. that club had that one success, then other clubs look at it and went, okay, we want that too. How can we replicate that? And then it just started a snowball effect. And it sounds like maybe actually something similar has happened with you guys in the province of Quebec. You had, you know, this mm -hmm. small team that was super driven and it's kind of, of that snowball effect, that knock-on effect to everybody else. And they go, to, okay, I want a piece of that too. And then that merges into the Canadian team set up and it sounds like that's what's you see, happening. That's, that's beautiful. That's how you create a strong country and you guys did it brilliantly, right? Yeah, it's really so. interesting. I think the, the interest from potentially a lot of the listeners that listen to our podcast that are very much, you know, the bulk of our listeners are British based British gymnastics fans uh, and we get a lot of athletes listening as well uh, our interest with Canada is that our old national coach went over to Canada and we kind of yeah. look over the other side of the uh, the pond and see that you guys are now having that success and people are going mm, that's interesting he's been successful here he's they're being successful over there how much is his influence having a positive impact over there um it didn't end very well over here with him in that situation. And, you know, he was very successful in the first part. I would say the first part of his career over here in Great Britain had incredible results. And he was a key part of that. He was very, very good at putting the right people in the right place and managing people and leading. And he, we certainly had a very clear vision, which we then, I feel, lost in the second part of, I would say, that time where he was the national coach. Um, and, and like I said, in terms of the success that we had under him, it was incredible, right? We'd never had that success before. And he was leading that for a long time. Uh, there's a separate conversation to another side that we'll leave for today, which is his ability to kind of man manage and some of his decision making towards the mm -hmm. end. But we yeah. kind of look over at Canada and seeing you guys having the success that you're having now and you go, well, he's kind of doing it twice. So it can't just be luck. It can't be a fluke. Uh, what role has Eddie Van Hoof played in the Canadian system? Um, and has that just coincided with everything working together at the right time and it's a perfect storm? Does that make sense? I know that you're still an athlete, so I'm not putting you in a precarious position. Uh, yeah, it's, no, just, no, no. it's more just from the gymnastic side of things. How is yeah, it yeah. structured from top to down, like head coaches, national coaches? How does that work, mate, in Canada? So I would say, I would say first of all, Eddie didn't, I mean, definitely arrived in Canada in a time and space where it was 
not easy. Okay. Not easy. And I'm talking not easy, like the, the whole structure of the Federation itself from the athlete in the clubs all the way up to somebody sending emails. It, it, it was difficult. It was definitely difficult. So I definitely believe that he took on a massive and humongous task to join up uh, the forces here. That definitely wasn't easy. Um, personally, you know, there's a lot to be said, but I feel like you've definitely gave very solid pointers in the fact that Eddie is definitely very, very strong to be a leader in a team where he can give, you know, say the real things to people uh, when they need to be said and really point in that solid direction where the, need, the, the team needs to be or to go. So I definitely believe that this was a massive game changer in the sense where uh, one year prior to the games, Antwerp, where everything needed to fall in line, he was there and he coordinated, you know, the, the, the training camp prior to that and, and, you know, who's going when and, okay, we, we might want to play like this. We might want to pull this guy out of pommel to put this guy out in pommel and then really kind of structure everything together. But to give you my very, very honest and transparent opinion, I think the fact that there was already a movement that was developing itself without necessarily him coming into play was definitely one of the biggest key factor of sure. the Canadian success. Uh, I think, you know, having a national coach that can guide the troops, if I can say so, is essential. But when you come with guys that have somewhat decent knowledge and experience with coaches and personal coaches specifically that are very tight and close with, I feel like that's where the magical connection is. Yeah. Cause you know, you guys probably, you probably dealt with that in, in, in the past and especially with the GB team, you have guys from the club here and then a guy, like guys from a club across the country and then this club and they all gather together to prep for a training camp for the Olympics or for worlds. Everybody have their own, you know, personal coach and, you know, they've been training and competing with them for years now. So they know each other very well. They know their need. They, they know their lacks and, and, and everything in between. And so <clears throat> I feel like sometimes for a national coach, which he's like not really a coach of anybody. He's like the coach of everyone yeah. to understand the needs of everybody else and to somehow in some in some type of way make everybody bond and kind of follow a similar program and follow similar similar rules is very challenging. Very, very, very challenging. But I think Eddie was good at doing this. Mm -hmm. He was very good at understanding the individual and then seeing their strength and then putting them together to make a whole. Because that's that's the real that's the real job of a national coach, right? Yeah. You can have somebody that is super good, super talented, works hard. He can be an Olympic medalist. That's wonderful. But his real job is to actually build a team around, not necessarily around this guy, but with this guy, yeah. with other dudes that are in the country to make this not only, oh, a country where you have this superstar in gymnastics who's really good, but actually a country where you have five, six, seven, ten guys that can build multiple teams that can perform on a longevity uh, in, in, in their career, right? And I think that's where the true challenge is. I think we'll have to wait and, and see, you know, how that goes because yeah. – we, we were somewhat of a young team and we, we do have even bigger ambitions in the future. And, you know, from, from what I know, uh, we'll definitely be, we'll, we'll definitely still be with, with, with Eddie at that time. So uh, we'll have to wait and see, but I mean, I, I feel like I haven't heard too, too much of the GB story when, when, when Ed was there, but I feel like for, for everything and anything that happened in Canada and for the moment and the, the timing he came in, I have to, you know, lift my hat up because it, it was definitely not uh, something that looked appealing, I believe, from the external side of you. But he still went in there. Yeah. And uh, overall, uh, we're, we're, we're definitely further ahead than we were. So, well, you've done an amazing yeah. job, mate, of explaining, I guess, the trajectory of the men's team over the past decade. Uh, for someone mm -hmm. over here in the UK that might not know, it's really interesting to, to hear how you guys had to almost force again we force it yeah. into action you know it's, it's a brilliant story because you have to sometimes you, you really have to push yeah them. sometimes you're in that position where you've got the people that are passionate right and they want it and they're there and they're working hard and it's not happening and you just kind of have to make it happen yourself and bring everybody else with you um absolutely it was a really good story mate uh just tell us a little bit then as we come towards the end 
I want to talk about Tokyo, but just tell me briefly about 2023. It was an amazing year for yourself, uh, <clears throat> Pan American Games, World Championships. Just tell me about that year, mate, and uh, what that did for you personally in your career going in then to the Olympic Games in 2024. Yeah, yeah, no, they're definitely a very successful year. Um, starting off with, you know, the, the World Championship was by far my only concern almost that year. I feel like... You know, the word, the, the word and the term all in was literally the definition of my everyday life. Me and the boys, me and the guys I was training with, me and my coach and the whole organization, we knew that this was not only kind of the only shot, but that was also our kind of last shot at it. Because the truth is, like I said previously, the the organization as a whole was not doing too, too good. And some of the guys, you know, we're, we're losing athletes every single year, whether it's, you know, through time and through injuries. And then now, because we can't even support the athlete and they have to move out of their houses, they have to study, they have to find a job and then they have to be the best in the world in their, in, in their sport. Like, come on, man. Like, like we can't, we're not superheroes here. Like we only have 24 hours in a day. It's very difficult to be completely, committed to seven different tasks in a day. And so we all came up together. We were like, listen, we have a shot at this world championship thing. We need to qualify a team. We need to make it happen for the younger generation that do believe in gymnastics in Canada, that do um, have that love for the sport and are passionate to, you know, pursue and, 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 and get the sport even higher than it is today. Right. And so once we really gathered that team uh, before Antwerp, we were like as, as ready as we could be, you know, training camps after training camps, boys were dedicated, sleeping extremely early, waking up extremely early because we knew we were competing in the morning over there. And, and my whole life, I'm, I'm saying me, but the, the whole team was, was dedicated to this, you know, dedicated to this. And I think showing up at Antwerp doing the results we did as a team in the qualification round was anything less than magical, you know, anything less than, I, I remember <laughs> like it's a, it's a moment in my career. I will most likely never forget in my life because it meant so much for me, so much for the team, so much for my coach, for, for, for the head coach, for, for Eddie, for, for everybody. And, and as a whole, I'm not very, I'm not an emotional guy uh, in life, but specifically in gymnastics, you know, I was told at a young age that you just don't necessarily show too much of your emotion. You just work and, 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 somewhat be quiet. It might sound bad, but <laughs> I'm, I'm just being very transparent. And so for me, that moment, I feel like, man, when I dropped out of that floor, when I walked down those stairs, I was the last routine of the comp. Uh, and when we knew it was locked in, like I had 14, five, we needed like 13, six, like we had like a point over minimum at least to hit our target score and to be pretty much certain that we were going to be qualified. And man, I think I lost like 40 pounds, like, <laughs> 40 pounds just came off of my shoulder. I remember grabbing and hugging one of my, you know, uh, best teammates, William Amar, a, a guy I grew up with, a guy I dreamed with uh, about going to the Olympics. And, you know, we had the same coach forever, same club and stuff. And I remember just hugging him and, and like, I just couldn't hold like almost the tears, you know, uh, coming out of me. Cause it was, it was so intense. It was so much pressure and seeing all that just like whew, falling down was like, God, like I can't, I can't even reckon another time in my life I felt like this, honestly. And so, and so, you know, qualifying for event finals. And then I was like, wow, oh, okay. The team is going to the Olympics. That's one thing. And then like, like, like we're already like kind of shaking about it, right? In the hotel, like I'm sitting in my couch and like, I just, I, I'm like numb. I'm like, like I, I, I don't even know what to say. And then the, later that night, I'm like, okay, I'm qualified for high bar. I'm qualified for floor. This can be massive. You know, this can be massive. I know these are two events I'm really strong at and specifically floor. I know I can, like, I'm a good floor performer fundamentally. Like when I show up in final on floor, like I kid you not, man, I can stick everything. I can do that nice landing. Like I know I have that in me, that little magic when it comes to final. So I'm like, okay, I have to, you know, I can make it work. You know, I can make it, I can make this, this crazy story into even a crazier one. Right. And that's really how I went into the final. I went all in. I was like, it's either I stick every single landing and I make it work or like I bounce out of the floor and it's done deal. But like, I, I'm not going to shy away from success. I want to go all in. So that's really how I went for both of my finals. So floor final was the first one I attended. Unfortunately, shy away from the, from the medal, two, two tenths away from the medal. Uh, the other guys on the floor, I mean, they did brilliant routines. Uh, mine was 
not bad, but definitely not magical. Like I, I, I wanted it to be. So I, I think I scored 14, six, 14, five along those lines. I ended up being fifth. So I was like, ah, damn, like my coach looked at me, you know, tapped on my, on my shoulder and he was like, he did a good work. And I remember looking at him being like, like almost pissed, you know, which quite unreasonable at that time. But I was like, what do you mean? Like, I told you I was going to bring back a medal. I'm like, uh, like I'm a, I'm a liar. You know, that's, that's like, that's disrespectful towards you. And he was like, no, no, you did good work. You still have high bar to go. I was like, okay. So uh, high bar final came across, uh, came around the corner. And then I remember same kind of mentality, right? I was like, listen, I'm going to go get the, those releases nice and, you know, far, not, not close. Like, I want to play it safe here. You know, I want to, I want to make it like a, a stamp, do the best possible routine I can. We, we don't get a shot at world's final every single day. Mm. So I, I have to make it as best as I can. I don't want to have any regrets. So I went into that final full extend, <laughs> full extend in my catch. And then we see what happened on, 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 on high bar. Then I, I really kind of fingertip my, my casino catch. Unfortunately, it didn't make it right. And then I felt again in the Takashi, I believe, or something like that. But these are all steps throughout like big competition. I've learned so, so much about me as an athlete, but also the, the sport itself. Mm. Um, but yeah, so for me, when you talk about 2023, that's what comes to my mind. Like that's right. the first and almost only thing that comes to my mind. I know like Pan Am games were huge for Canadians and specifically okay. also for me. I mean, I had, you know, great, great results. And the whole country, you know, as a whole loved it because this is one of the biggest events here in Canada okay. where Canadians, Canadian brands, Canadian supporters really watch this event because it right. really kind of okay. tells that, okay, this guy is a, you know, really high level Canadian athlete because these are games. So for me personally, do I really value those results in a sense where I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Honestly, not really, okay. because I know the best from the USA weren't there. So I'm like, I'm like, was it great? Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I went there with the mentality after seeing who was there. I was like, listen, I have to win the all around. Like, there's no, like, like if I don't win the all around, I definitely like left some opportunities on the table. And then I was like, I have to win floor. And then I have to win high bar. And then I, I want a medal on P bar. So I basically wanted to have like a medal a little bit everywhere. And that's when I, that's when I started the competition. I was, you know, selected for the all around final. Then I won the all around. Then I went for, for a rings final. I got my medal full final. I got my medal, but then when was the qualification round? I felt on, um, on P bars and my onma. when I started my routine, I, I, my, my, my thumb was like on the bar. So I kind of crashed in my onma. I kept going my routine, but I lost my final there. Okay. And then on high bar, same thing happened. I, I, I felt in, I, I don't remember what skill specifically, but I lost my final there also. So I was quite disappointed after everything that happened, even mm -hmm. at Pan Am games, I remember talking to, um, people interviewing me and they were like, Felix, this is unbelievable record. Uh, it's been 60 years since the Canadian man won the all around title. Like, how do you feel? And I was like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of bummed out. Like I didn't get in a high bar final, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's great. You know, I got other medals. I'm really happy, but I mean, I definitely left like two on the table that I could have bring back for the mm -hmm. country. So uh, it could have been better. Right. And people were looking at me like, yeah, you're stupid or what? Like you're crazy. <laughs> and I was like, no, like I'm, I'm grateful for it. Like it's yeah. definitely like, cool results and I'm super happy. And you know, that's, that's, I wanted them, but I feel like I also left two out yeah. and two is significant. So I was like, uh, I mean, if I'm, if I have to be honest and, and transparent, like, like I have to tell you how I feel. Right. But th these were definitely really big highlights, you know, that year, but man, those, those world championship, these are, this is something like to this day, when I think about it, it gives me goosebumps. Like it's, it's stupid. You Completely have such stupid. a great mentality, mate. It's very infectious. You know, uh, I, I remember feeling the same after we uh, we had F Fred Richard on the podcast. I remember afterwards kind of looking at Sam mm -hmm. and I kind of saying, oh, that guy's going to be successful, man. Like, you just, <laughs> you have that thing. Uh, a bit like, similar to like Niall Wilson when he was like 22, 23, kind of at his peak. Just that relentlessness, that competitiveness, that just mm -hmm. wanting to be the best. Like, I think you have to have that to be the best. Uh, it sounds obvious, Absolutely. right? But it's not easy to be that guy because when you put yourself out there like that, it can be quite a lonely place no, to be, very, right? No, yeah. it's very lonely. No, no, yeah. definitely, definitely. And like I said, like, sometimes I say it in a funny way mm. where like, oh, people are like, oh, he's crazy. But that's genuine. I can that's tell genuine. you mean like, it. Like, people, it's sincere, right? People you definitely don't necessarily want to be around me because yeah. like, even when it comes to my teammates, I'm, I'm quite hard on them sometimes because I'm like, listen, man, I'm looking at you right now and you're not working at, like you're not doing your best. Like I can tell, 
Like, and, I, and I'm your friend and I'm just, I'm just that guy. Like I say things <laughs> how they are and he's going to look like me. He's going to be, man, you're like a dickhead, bro. Like, like, leave me alone. And I'm like, Hey, you want to be average? No problem. Just say it, you know, just say it. And, and then it's like, but I can see I kinda, why you didn't, I can see that. why it didn't work. You being in team sports. <laughs> yeah. You see, that's exactly it. Right. But at the same time, I feel like the fact that I have this mentality is really like a, a double edged sword because it really pushes me as an individual. And I feel like I can also apply this mentality outside of the sport, which is sure. great. It pushes me as an individual to be better every day and every time I do something. But at the same time, I, I, that's something I realized later on in the, my life, I'd say. So it's very difficult to to be happy just in general, you know, be uh, like, I, I do look like a very smiling guy, a happy guy, but, you know, I, I had to deal for the, for the longest time, you know, with, with mental uh, uh prep guys for you know being able to just not live with yourself but it's just like you know um you don't really feel always fulfilled in that sense where it's like the fulfillment and the gratification time frame is so small for me whereas like i would achieve something that is massive that is great that i wanted deeply to achieve but i would say you know a day later depending on how great the, the achievement was this feeling will be gone you know this feeling will be gone and i will have to keep going or else you know, I, I don't, I don't feel right. You know, I, I don't feel too, too good about it. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a yeah, complicated it's, thing, mate. It's complicated. Yeah. Look, I've had my own experiences of that. I think that relentlessness and that competitiveness, it works in sport, but sometimes doesn't work in other areas of your life. So that's, Absolutely. that's where Absolutely. you have to learn. Okay. But any smart athletes around you will see you and go, I'm going to go with this guy because he's going places. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I might not like mm -hmm. him sometimes, but I know he's going to where I want to be. So I'm going to go with him. Exactly. So, um, exactly. It's great to like, hear that. I do, it's very refreshing. Yeah. Very I, refreshing. I, I do live pretty good with it though, on a social level. Yeah. Because like you said, you know, like outside of gymnastics, there's some normal people out there. Like they're just trying to do their thing and live their lives. And sometimes they're going to be looking at you and be like, man, yeah. this, it can this, be quite intense. That, that energy can be quite intense for people, right? Like that yeah, just yeah. relentlessness, never stopping, especially if you like the standards you keep for yourself. If you push those upon others, that can, it can be quite challenging yeah. for people, right? It can be um, very, yeah. Crazy, crazy. But in sport it's super important. I think the last thing I want to talk about, mate, just uh, is obviously Tokyo uh, and the Olympic Games. You guys did amazing. You qualified for the team final. I know you said that you felt like you could done a, could have done a lot better. Uh, just tell me about your performance in the team final, how you felt about that. And then lastly, uh, let's talk about the all-around final because that was a big... Mm -hmm. You know, we spoke about gymnastics almost having, I feel like gymnastics just had like a viral moment this Olympic Games. Like it was great, yeah. man. Like, Multiple whether, of them. Yeah, yeah, whether it was Simone or or Steven on Steven. Pommel Horse, like <laughs> it, was, it was so cool. It was so great for the sport. And you're right, we have yeah. to really like make the most of that right now. Um, and yeah. and I, I actually, I still play football, so soccer for you guys. <laughs> yeah. And I went to a pre-season pre training session and this guy said, okay. Sam, I've just been watching the Olympics and this guy from Canada just fell off the bar. It was like the craziest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. I was like, yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? High bar. And I, he was like, what did you used to do? I was like, I used to do high bar. He was like, whoa, that's mad. I was like, yeah. So it's, it's cool, you know, that um, people like recognize, number one, how dangerous the sport is, but number two, just how incredible those athletes are, right? Uh, so just tell me about your performance in the team final and then the all-around final. Yeah, so in, in, in Paris, you know, I feel, I feel like every single one of the guys in the team really just went into the team final in the headspace where they were very happy, but also they kind of felt... Um, how to say this in the right way, they, they kind of felt like somewhat already achieved, which they weren't mistaken in the sense where we like at the single like moment where we stepped onto the field as a team final uh, for Team Canada at the Olympics, it was historical, right? So that was already kind of, the achievement was already made. I like to put quotes like this because uh, I believe there was more to be gained there, but you know, I feel like it, it was definitely a fun competition on my personal performance wise. I would say it was acceptable. Honestly, nothing, nothing really, really crazy. Um, I, when I, when I say this, I think about like 
P bars. I mean, I was definitely struggling with a, like a lot of blood and blister on my head, which definitely gave me a tr- troublesome time with the grip. But it, it was reasonable score. I mean, reasonable routines, really nothing too, too crazy, mm. which is also one of the reasons why, you know, I, I feel like we could have as a team gained a little bit more. But the overall mentality when we went in there is that we weren't, I feel like we kind of, we were like, oh, we won already. You know, so I don't know if it was a way of us dropping the stress level or just to feel mm. better about, you know, ourselves achieving this accomplishment. But I feel like the reality is until the fifth event, which was Pummel Horse at that time, we were sitting on the on, on the sixth, sixth place, I believe, which at that like was our team goal. That was the team expectation with the head coach, with the guys, right. with everybody. We said, listen. Let's make it the top six. That would be wonderful. If we can push it to fifth, hey, be my guest. But top six would definitely be a great, great achievement. And I truly believe that too at that time. And so sitting on Pummel Horse, we know Pummel Horse is definitely a very, very difficult event uh, as a whole, but also for Team Canada specifically. And so we had we had, uh, we had, had a tough time. We had a tough time. One of the boys, I think, fell twice, uh, once or twice, I believe. So definitely, you know, it impacted the score uh, in, in, a, in a major way. And so... As, as a teammate that wasn't competing pummel horse, my job is to take the whole team and be like, guys, there's one more to go. Let's go. Rings is a strong event for Team Canada. We need to just get that landing. Good strength. You guys are strong. And just, you know, ramp up the, the team to make sure they're ready to give the 200% left they have in the tank to hopefully somewhat make it into maybe the seventh, maybe squeeze it. I don't know. Like, you know, the, the scores are unrolling each other. Everything's going so fast, but it's never done until it's done. So let's, you know, let's, let's give it our all and let's, you know, put it all out there. Just, just no regrets. So we showed up onto the, onto the ring, even, you know, we know we had, you know, a tough score that counted uh, on pummel horse, but everybody looked like they were ready to, you know, give everything they, they, they had. And so we we started the final. I believe I was first on ring. Very reasonable routine. Nothing crazy out of the ordinary. Just very very normal. And then Will I think uh, followed up, which is very very strong on rings. He made a nice routine. He was very pumped about it. And then we had uh, Rene, which which he was the athlete that that basically fell on pummel horse. Um, he did an okay routine, honestly, very respectful all the way towards the end, where I feel like I can't really tell if he was out of juice. I can't really tell if it was more an a a motivational aspect where he knew he kind of bummed out the team on the fifth event. So it kind of impact also his uh, performance on the sixth, because when he performed his dismount, he, he, he then proceeded to, to fail his dismount again. So then we took another, another hit uh, on rings towards the last two events. So it was, it, 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 we, we got close. We definitely got close to achieving yeah. that sixth spot. I feel like those two big, those two or three big mistakes towards the end, definitely, you know, cost it all. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was overall an achievement to be there. Uh, but I feel like I said previously coming out of those, I mean, specifically that, that team final, I was like, damn, man, I feel like we, we just, we just lost, like, like left something on the table towards the end. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So it's, that's why like the, the kind of bit bitter taste towards the end came. And then you all around yeah. me, obviously just tell me a little bit about, about the mm-hmm. fall on high bar and the grip, I guess my, the questions that came to mind straight away for me when I watched that on TV was, number one, had your hand guards been, you know, were they wearing thin in the lead up so, to that competition or not? And, and then number two, were you aware of the, obviously the equipment failure rule prior mm-hmm. to the routine? Um, because I know for a while you would see gymnasts have now learned to lie down, right? If you fall off because yep. the, the timer doesn't start. So they were the two big questions for me. Number one, were your hand guards giving you issues prior to that routine? Number two, were you aware of that rule in terms of the equipment failure? And how quickly did you make the decision, I'm going to start again? So basically to, to, to straight up go for your two, answer, uh, your two questions. Um, first of all, the what you need to know about that story, which... Very few people know. Uh, Team Canada went to do a training camp in the south of France. I would say two to three weeks ish prior to the games itself. Okay. I was working with a pair of grips that was totally fine. Uh, during a mock meet, a week before the games, I was doing a layout like a full mock meet. So I was in, in a full on routine, and my grip snapped in layout to catch it. Proceeded to fall very, basically the same way I did at the Olympics. 
but this time my knee hit my head and I had like a, like a major bruise. They did concussion test. I was fine. And it hit my bicep. My bicep was fully bruised, but it, you know, it was just a little bit of pain. And then I had the second pair, brand new pair with me that I used for a week and another week, the, the, the week where I was in Paris in the Olympic village, but you know, we're, we're training prior to com- the, the, the competition. Yeah. So I had a pair that was technically used for two weeks. So only, and and that that is the pair that broke on that high bar. So to answer your question, this pair was not like broken in any sort of way. This pair wasn't chipped in any sort of way, and it was it was it was new. Wow, it was so somewhat that's new. Cra- that's right? crazy. So that's so bad for that brand. Of it. I'm guessing you're not so going to use was, those guards again. It right? was definitely quite bad for the brand. They definitely had quite a bit of backlash. But the reality is, you know, and I even told the media, like some of the media wanted me to go like straight up after them, and I said, listen. I'm being completely honest here. They've supported me. I mean, they, they've been my, 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 my hand grips brand for many, many years. I've trained with them. I've performed with them. I've won medals with them. Mm. Who would I be to say that in that specific time and moment, they broke that point fingers at the people that actually, you know, made my grips for several years and made it yeah. successfully. Right. Cause the truth is as gymnasts, we know it can happen, right? Yeah. We, we, we know it can happen. Uh, it's, it, of course we don't like, we don't jump on the bars like, ah, that, that's the time where it's going to snap, like not like that, but it, it's, it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, and we, and we still decide to do it. Right. And I think that's where the whole, um, that's where the whole side of being a gymnast and the recognition that people saw through my failure or through my, my, my hand guard snapping into is, it's listen, man, doing gymnastics is hella scary, hella dangerous, but people do it anyways. These athletes are crazy. They're superheroes. Right. And I think that's where the credit came from, you know, the, the eyes that were watching me while I was performing, while I was feeling down. And that's what I love about it. If, if somebody can come back home that never knew anything about the sport that but that watched me flip out a high bar and, 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 and go back onto it and comes back home. And he's like, wow, these guys are genius. These guys are, you know, warriors. Then I love that. I love yeah. that because I truly believe that every single gymnast out there in any countries. Are, are, are really brave dudes, man. They're, they're really giving their all to perform what they love, perform something that is risky, but at the same time, beautiful to watch and extremely, you know, challenging. And I feel like that's the whole beauty of the sport, right? So if any kind of way I was able to give back to the sport or give back to the community, man, I would fall off high bar tomorrow, <laughs> you know? It was, like, a great, it was a great moment, mate, and you so, certainly did that. I think it it certainly gave uh, gymnastics a lot of a lot of respect from people that were watching because yeah. when you see a fall like that off high bar, I always say to people, high bar is amazing because if you do well, it looks great. If you do bad, it looks mm-hmm. great. It's just, yeah. it's just it's like the yeah. most exciting yeah, yeah. event, right? So have, have that brand reached out to you? You know, you said you worked with them to talk to you about how can we improve the lever that we're working with? Because two yeah. weeks isn't enough, is it? Like a pair of guards should be lasting a lot longer than two weeks. I remember, Not you well. know, early on in my career, the lever of the guards that I would use was using would last a long time, like six months. And then there was just a period of time yeah. where it seemed to be going like every three or four weeks. I was getting up thinking, I think these are going to snap. Like, Yeah, no, no. Um, I, I, I did get in contact with them. I mean, they, they, they reached out, they apologized. They, they were, they wanted to make sure I was, you know, fine and right. And I, I, I told them, you know, I said, this is very unfortunate, but listen, like I'm not, I won't go after you for, 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 sure, for, yeah. for that reason. Like the fact is you guys, were my my brand for so many years and listen it's just part of the job you know it's part of the job and I kind of signed that paper when I say I want to be a professional gymnast and so we but we did go through some 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 little tweaks to see if I could get like a thicker leather and to something that just could you know be more reliable in that sense yeah. and uh but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but I, I I definitely do not want them to have any sort of backlash yeah, and of like you know yeah, yeah. it's just making making sure like, that doesn't like, happen again because that is that's like your worst no, nightmare sure. right that, that yeah, is your worst sure. nightmare you train your whole life for that moment and you that's did for sure. and that's like the one oh, thing no. you don't expect to happen isn't it you know um, yeah you yeah, know exactly but that's also like you know some of the people after this after what happened you know were talking to me or in, in interviewers or, or friends family or people on the street literally be like damn like you must have feel so bad and you must feel like like you hate the whole world and the truth is that i feel kind of bad on the spot about it of course you know i was quite pissed but i'm i feel like mentally i've worked so much on myself that i like i said previously in the in, in the podcast now i i do understand that there's time and places in life where i won't be able to control what happens 
I don't decide if my grip snaps or not, you know? And if that's the case, if I can't control what's going to happen, I, I cannot allow myself to spend too much energy, too much emotion or time into thinking or, 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 or expressing my feelings about it. Cause, cause it's not like I, I, I can control it. I can't do nothing about it, but what I can control, I will put my energy, I will put my time into it. And the, the matter is I could control my comeback. I could control me going back on a high bar. I can control me keep going through the competition. Even, even if my back, my knee and my hand was completely obliterated at that time. These are things I can control. So that's why I, 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 I did something about it, right? But the fact is, man, like I, I, I didn't click a button, just snap the, you know, the thing in half. So I, I feel, I feel like I got good at doing this, and I feel like it's important, especially on a, you know, professional level. We, we go through so much pressure, so much stress. Uh, the demand is unbelievable on a daily basis. That if you don't understand that there's some things from time to time that will happen, will affect you ne- negatively, but you cannot control that. You need to just leave yeah. away. You'll kind of you'll be eating yourself up. I think that's a, a great message, me. And I honestly, when you when you chose to go again, and you got back on yeah. and you started the routine and you caught your casino, I was on my feet going, "Yes, come on!" Yeah, because it's so like you could have quite easily left it out of the routine, right? But it yeah. makes so much sense having had that conversation with you today. And that I quite often think that your job as an athlete, it, obviously you want to win. That's the most important thing is winning medals. At the end mm. of your career, what have you done? What have you achieved? But sometimes yeah. how you make someone feel with your performance, that's the thing Absolutely. that they remember forever. And, and for me, I'll remember that. When I think about the games, that's one of the moments I think about. And I think it's, it's that story behind you not giving up and carrying on. Um, I truly appreciate that. No, you're very welcome, the- mate. It was a great moment. And, uh, and like I said, just meeting a guy that knows nothing about gymnastics but was engaged in it with his son because he watched you do that was so cool. Just to finish yeah, off, mate, cool. you've been a great guest and I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Just tell us what your plans are for, for the future. Um, and where people can maybe find you online and find the podcast that you have uh, with your friends. Yeah, uh, so plans in the future. Uh, right now, I'm slowly, uh, like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm back in training. I'll be back competing. In, a, in about a month, I'll be in Germany to compete in the, actually not even a month, uh, just a couple of weeks, barely. Uh, I'll be in Germany to compete in the Bundesliga. I'll be doing this for for the whole season, uh, pretty much until the, I would say, mid, mid-December. Uh, afterwards, it's really going to be, you know, putting specific time work onto the new code because I, I, I want to do a couple international invitational competition. And then we have the world uh, championship in about, what, nine, nine months, eight months, something like this. And, you know, I really, really plan on, on, on making it big there. You know, I feel like, you know, the Olympics were great in multiple ways. But like I said previously, uh, and I, I feel like it's, it's easy to tell uh, when you hear me out. Uh, I haven't gotten exactly what I wanted out of these uh, bigger games. And so, you know, I, I want to be world champion. You know, I want to be world champion. I want to I want to be out there even better uh, as an all-arounder. I want to see, you know, Canada as a, as a whole being performing better. So these are all missions of mine that I have on a somewhat short former term. Uh, other than that, of course, I want to take part in every single games I can. I want to still do at least one more Olympic Games, Olympic cycle, if not two. It's kind of far, far away to say, but you know, uh, my 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 dream when I was younger is to make three Olympics. I wasn't able to make to Tokyo because of the COVID, and so um, I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll be out there for the taking if I if I can make three games for sure. But other than that, you know, there's there's all the the, the sideline stuff outside of gymnastics that is going uh, on now. So onto another kind of career ish. Either you know making sure my studies are right, making sure my my, my businesses are right. So uh, so yeah, I'm very busy, but but I love it. You know, I love it. I, I need to be busy in that life because uh, or else I kind of go crazy. So yeah, <laughs> amazing, mate. And where can people uh, find the podcast that you record with your teammates? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, it's the The Rise podcast. You can find them on YouTube, uh, TikTok, and Instagram. So uh, we're posting. I would say. Not daily, of course. Uh, it's it's very kind of when we feel like it. At the beginning, we used to do it once a week. Maybe nowadays it's more like every two to three weeks. Uh, these are episodes of about like 25 minutes, 30 minutes. And then sometimes we post snippet also on the social media sites. But if they want, also want to find my personal platform, TikTok, Instagram, Felix Dolce, uh, usually you should you should find me there. So. Amazing, mate. You're doing a great job of promoting the sport, so keep doing it. Um, having chatted Thanks to you today, so I am... 
you know, I know you're going to have lots of success in the future. So don't change who you are, mate. It's brilliant. And uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Sam. Thank you.